situation. Speak that name over your disease. Speak that name over depression. Speak that name over fear. Speak that name of Jesus over your finances. Oh, we speak Jesus in this place. Oh, Jesus. all over this place. Let's worship Him from our heart. Hallelujah. 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 Jesus' name. Jesus. 
Jesus name in Jesus name in Jesus name Hallelujah Hallelujah in Jesus name Worship him, church. Just worship him. Just praise him. Hallelujah. you for responding to the presence of God today. If you're a guest here, we are so pleased that you are here today. Thank you so much for coming and being a part of Life Point Church. We all come from different backgrounds, different experiences. But what is happening in this place? right now is a move of God. This is what happened when God moves among the people. There's miracles happening in here right now. People's lives are being changed. There's healing in this building right now. We have quite a few that are not due to travel or some are not feeling well and um, Mariah is in the hospital and she needs she needs a miracle she needs a miracle I won't go into details but God is God we're going to call on God to touch her right now <clears throat> so I would ask my wife to come up I want you to pray over Cheyenne she's got Mariah right there with her and I want, to, I want us to pray right now that God will touch this young lady that is in the hospital and do a miracle in her body can we pray right now in the name of Jesus I pray over Mariah I pray over this family I rebuke this illness in the name of Jesus in its place I command through the power that's in the name of Jesus that healing would fill every part, every issue, every problem, every situation that is going on in her body. Lord Jesus, the doctors may not understand, but you know exactly what to do and how to do it. And God, through the power in your name, I pray right now that you will heal her body, that you will touch her, Jesus. Touch her mind. Touch this family and strengthen them. Touch those who are not well today, God. Jesus, for Brenda, for Jim, Lord, for many others that are not feeling well, God, touch them and lift them up. Protect those who are traveling. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Now, I think it would just be proper if we were just to worship like we just... Hallelujah. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Hallelujah. 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 In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Wow. I knew something good was going to happen today. Amen. According to the battle of this morning. <laughs> Hallelujah. Anybody else have to fight a battle to get here today? <laughs> 
Brother Joe. <laughs> the golf cart, the battery wasn't working right last week, so we had to park it. This week, the brake locked up in the front, so we had to park it. And while we were trying to park it, a bee flew in his ear and stung him in the ear. He swatted it out, and his hearing aid went flying across the parking lot. We found that, thank God. He's still with us. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> I broke a window yesterday, weed whacking out here in the garden. Uh, it's just been uh, it's been a couple days. Amen. Uh, that always adds up to the same thing: a powerful move of God on Sunday morning. And so if you persevered and you pressed through, it was for a good thing. Hallelujah. Amen. know the devil irritates us the best way to get him back is to just stay faithful you know maybe you being here today is his biggest problem all week then it give you a little bit of pleasure amen oh well i'm going to get into the word of god today i want you to pray with me that god would touch our hearts and open our minds to what he has to say to us encouragement would fill us understanding would fill us. Let's pray together. In the name of Jesus, I pray over this congregation, over myself, Lord, that you would let an anointing flow through me, that you would let an anointing flow through this congregation. God, that you would open our minds and ears to your word. Jesus, in your name we pray, in Jesus' name, amen. Why don't you greet somebody in the lovely name of Jesus before you're seated. Just tell them how good it is to see them here today. Amen. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Jesus' name. Jesus' name. <clears throat> there is a place. How many of you ever made a reservation? Usually, I don't think McDonald's takes reservations. Even Chick-fil-A doesn't happen. It's usually a nice place, a place that's popular, a place that's in demand, a place that a lot of people want to be. And so you make a reservation. But there, there is a reservation made for us, made for those who are covered by the blood of Jesus, who are born again of water and spirit. <laughs> Hallelujah. There's a place called heaven. And... <clears throat> This place is so incredible that we cannot possibly comprehend its beauty. We cannot grasp how, inc how incredibly beautiful it is and how amazing it is and, and what the experience will be. Now, I've, I've preached on this before, and I've taken time to describe, most of the time I describe the construction materials of this custom-built by God himself place of paradise. That's just my natural bent is that's kind of who I am. But I want to talk a little bit more today about some other, some other aspects of heaven. Some things that we may not think about quite as much, but they're just as real. And that they're just as powerful as walking on streets of gold. And, and I can't help it. I just can't help it. It's, it's just part of, of, of heaven. And to talk about just walk and see that huge gate of pearl and seeing walls of jasper and precious stones being used to build things. And it's just, why is that? And we've talked about this so many times. Why would God take the things that we call the most precious and make those two-by-fours and drywall? Does that make sense? Because there, that's really what it's going to mean to us compared to what else is there. Amen. Compared to what heaven is really about, compared to what we're to experience and what we're going to feel and what we're not going to feel. Can I have a little bit of an amen on that side? <laughs> if you're in a little bit of pain today, that's not going to be there anymore. <clears throat> if you're dealing with issues in your life, they're not going to be there anymore. If you're dealing with depression, it's not going to be there. If you're dealing with pressure in your life, it's not going to be there. It's just going to be peace. That may be one of the hardest things in the world for me to describe to other human beings in our day is absolute and total peace because we really don't get it because we don't really get to get it. We live in a chaotic world. There's always something. 
And we have the peace of God that passes all understanding, right? That comes through the power of the Holy Ghost. And so that gets me through things that are very, very difficult. And it gives me that sense of calm and what the world calls peace and what the Bible calls peace is two different things, amen? But that, that, that just understanding that God is in control is going to be a whole lot different when we get to heaven. Because there will be nothing for God to control. When I say I have peace in knowing that God has got me in his hands, I'm usually trying to tell you that I'm going to be okay through whatever I'm going through, right? That's what that means. That God, some of you are going through some crazy things right now. Pressure in your life. Things on your mind. And you say, well, I know God's got me. I know God's going to take care of it. Some people call it a crutch. It's called faith. It's called faith. And we need it. We need it, but we won't need it in heaven. There will be no need for faith because there will be no need for healing. There will be no, no uh, I know God's going to get me through because there won't be anything to go through. We will live in a place where there will be no more problems, no more trials, no more tribulations, no more rotten devil. No more weak flesh. <laughs> Uh, I'm not going to ask how many people you uh, had to contend with your flesh this week because I already know. All of us. All of us. Amen. I had to contend with it a little bit this morning on the church property. I'm the pastor. I hit the golf cart with a two by four. It sounds worse than it was. I was trying to loosen up the brake thing. Amen. But it, it did feel good anyway. Amen. <laughs> We're trying to get the brake unseized. <laughs> I wanted to hit it with the two by four. <laughs> Amen. That's what I'm talking about. We, we won't have any broke down golf carts in heaven. Your car won't give you trouble. You don't have to worry about paying the bills. Some of you are scared to death. The electric bill is going to come in. There's going to be more than you can handle because that's where we live. That's where we live. What are we going to do when the prices go up again? What happens if this? What happens if that? Now the grain's going to go up, and now the fuel's going to go up, and all these things that buzz around in our brains will be gone, and we will worship around the throne for eternity. We will worship around the throne for eternity. Now, the Bible tells us, and very specifically, Jesus said it to Nicodemus in John 3, that no man can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again of water and of spirit. He was very specific. Baptism in Jesus' name is the water. <clears throat> the infilling of the Holy Ghost is the spirit. Now, I'm going to do a lot of reading today. I'm going to warn you, but I want to, it's the best way for me to try to even attempt to help you understand the end results of the victory over sin. This place called heaven and the victory over sin that is won by the Most High God, and his name is Jesus. Listen to what Paul says, 2 Corinthians 12.1. It is not expedient or possible for me to doubtless to glory, but I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I know a man in Christ above 14 years ago, whether in body I cannot tell or out of the body I cannot tell, God knows, such as one caught up to the third heaven. And I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell, God knows. I don't know if this was him actually experiencing this or if he had a vision. Um, but he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words, which is not lawful for man to utter. What is he saying? He's saying that there is a place that is so beyond our understanding. It is so far out of our grasp that there really are no words to describe it completely. There's really no way for us to get a concept of what it is that God has for us, that it is so high above anything we've experienced that we can't possibly get it. Here's a word from Peter, 1 Peter 1.3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again unto lively hope. Uh, he born, he, we were born again unto lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that fades not away, reserved in heaven for you. You have an inheritance that is not money that can be lost. 
It is not a house that can be burnt down. It is not something that we can hold in our hand because then we can lose it from our hand. It is incorruptible. It is above anything we could gain here. We, are, we really need to get this concept, church, that there is a great inheritance for those who serve and love him. And it is beyond this world. It is beyond anything that we could experience. I love that last part. It is reserved in heaven for you. Reserved in heaven for you. Who are kept by the power of God through faith and the salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time, wherein you greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, you are in heaviness through manifold temptations. That's where we are, right? That through the trial of your faith, being more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. All these things work together for the good of them that love him. That's what the Bible says. That these things that we contend with now, they help purify us and prepare us for that inheritance. Whom not, having not seen, ye love in whom thou you know, see him not, yet believing, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. When we see Jesus, I, I don't know if this ever happens to you, but the Bible tells us that he's coming in the clouds. The Bible tells us that he's coming in the eastern sky. This is all throughout the word of God. That when he comes to take his church back, that we will see him and we will be taken up with him. This is what the rapture is. This is when he takes his church and brings it to that place. And when we see that, it will be joy unspeakable and full of glory. Now, I, this is odd. This is an odd message for me. It's an odd cadence. It's an odd, odd way of me presenting it. This is not normal for me, but this is what God wants us to hear today, that there's coming a day that none of this will matter. There's coming a day that the pressure will not be there. There's coming a day when you see me in the clouds, nothing else even is going to matter. We won't even be able to describe how we feel. Now, John, John gives us the most information from his place of great trial. I think it's good for us sometimes to remember where these amazing words came from. All of Revelation came from a, a, a prison island. They dropped John off. You're too much trouble. We can't contend with you. You're a bother. You're messing with society. You believe in this Jesus. Nobody wants to hear it, so just go over there by yourself and die. He wasn't writing from a palace. He was writing from a place that was intended to very, very long-term punish people until they just died. That's where he's writing from. Paul wrote most of his letters from a dungeon. He was in shipwrecks. He, was, he experienced a lot of different things. So we need to be encouraged and understand what was happening here. But a place of torment, a place for troublemakers, a place for unredeemable criminals. When they put you on the Isle of Patmos, what they were saying is, there's no hope for you. You're too far gone, so we're just going to put you over here and you'll kill each other off. That's the plain English of it, but it's the truth. This is where John is, and this is what he writes. Uh, and he's having a vision. I, John, who also am your brother and a companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was in the isle called Patmos for the word of God, for the testimony of Jesus Christ. This is not my message, but he recognizes why he's here. God, sent, God allowed this to happen for a purpose. Verse 10, And I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. And what thou seest, write in a book and send it to the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, 
Thyatira, Sardis, and Philadelphia, and Laodicea. And I turned to see the voice that spake to me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. In the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like to the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to foot, and the gird around the paps with a golden girdle. One that looked like Jesus. This is what he was saying. And he was dressed this way, with his head and his hairs were white like wool, and white as snow, and his eyes as the flame of fire, his feet under fine brass as they burned in a furnace, uh, and his voice the sound of many waters. He had on his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a two-edged short sword, and his countenance was as the sun shining in his strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, and he laid his right hand on me, saying, Get up, or saying, Fear not, I am the first and the last. And he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. What was he saying? Yes, that's right, I'm Jesus. I was one who lived and died, but now I live forevermore. But he's not talking with that soft-spoken voice that Jesus spoke to him so many times, that, that conversation voice that he heard, even the voice that he would command demons to come out. It is now fully and completely God flowing through this man. And his voice was as of many waters, and there was a sharp two-edged sword that came out of his mouth, and he burned like he was on fire, and fire came out of his eyes. I'm talking about a powerful God. John is having an interaction with now who he completely understands. Wait a minute. Uh, yeah, I can see that's Jesus, uh, but I see all God now. I see all powerful God now. Uh, here's the best part of this phrase. I am alive evermore, amen, and have the keys of hell and death. I own it all. What a vision. What a taste that John had of the end time. A glimpse into the future. So there's heaven. What's going to happen? What is it all about? What's the reality of it? We have so many things that we talk about and they're all bits and pieces and parts. And I'm not necessarily trying to straighten out your idea of heaven. I want you to understand there's going to be a lot going on. That it's not going to be a place where you just sit there and be bored. In case somebody thought that. Oh, I'm just going to go to heaven and do what? Play a harp? Right? I'm going to fly around with my... I don't know what everybody thinks. You need to get into the Word of God. Amen. <laughs> I don't need a harp. Amen. I'm <laughs> just looking for a place of peace. Well, let's go to Revelations 4.1. And after this, I looked, and behold, a door was open in heaven. And the first voice I heard was like a trumpet talking with me and said, Come up here, and I will show you the things which must be thereafter. And immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven. What? One sat on the throne. That's about as plain as it gets. And his name is Jesus. <laughs> One sat on the throne. Mm. And he that was sat was to look upon like jasper and a sardine stone, and there was rainbow round about the throne, and his sight like unto an emerald. This is John grasping. Anybody feel that? Ah, how do I explain this? How do I? He's like looking at a, a, a jeweled stone, and there's a rainbow, and then it looks like emeralds. And how do, how do I? Because he's, re, he's relating to things that he's seen and understands that they are valuable. But he can't comprehend it. And around the throne were four and twenty seats, and upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting, clothed in white raiment, and they had their heads crowns of gold. And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices, and there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was a sea of glass like unto crystal. Anybody ever say, wow, look at that bay. It looks like a sheet of glass. A sea of glass, like unto crystal, in the midst of the throne. Oh, pause. What does that mean? What does it mean when the bay is glass? It's calm. Just, just recently in the boating, I'm a newbie. 
and I don't really like it when it's not flat. I don't, I don't care for it when it's choppy and sloppy. I guess I'm just not hardcore enough yet when it comes to boat. I'll climb any ladder, I'll swing any hammer, but me in the water, we just, uh, I like it flat. Amen. What does it mean it's calm? I could tell by just going across the bridge what the boat ride's going to be like because I have enough sense to understand flat is good, peaceful, calm. I go out on the boat to relax, not to fight. I'm glad it didn't say that the waves were slapping up against the throne and there was spray everywhere. And there was, t- I'm glad it's not going to be that way. I'm glad it was like glass. I don't even know what I'm talking about. It's just peaceful. It's peaceful. It was like under crystal in the midst of the throne, around about the throne were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. And all the angels stood round about the throne and all the elders and the four beasts and fell before the throne on their faces and worshiped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these that are arrayed in white robes, and where did they come from? And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said to me, These are they which came out of the great tribulation. This wasn't even happened yet. This hadn't even come to pass yet. John didn't even understand what he was talking about, the great tribulation. And they have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he that sits on the throne shall dwell among them and they shall hunger no more neither thirst any more neither shall sun light upon them nor any heat for the lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them and lead them unto the living fountains of water and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes uh, whatever it is that we've faced uh, that has made us sad whatever we have dealt with that has crushed our heart uh, when we get to heaven God's going to wipe away all all the tears from our eyes. We won't have the ability to cry anymore. We won't need the ability anymore. Mm. Revelation 8. And when he had opened the seventh seal, there was a silence in heaven for the space of a half hour. And I saw the seven angels which stood before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. And another angel could, came and stood above the altar, and having a golden censer, which was given to him much incense, that he should offer it with the prayers of all saints upon the golden altar, which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense, which came in with the prayers of the saints, ascended up before God out of the angel's hands. And the angel took the censer and filled it with the fire on the altar and cast it to the earth. And there were voices and thunderings and lightnings and an earthquake. Church, prayer matters. Prayer does things. God moves on prayer. God moves on prayer. I, I, this is, I'm going to tell you this is me. This is how I see this right now. I am not telling you 100%. This is just solid rock. This is me. And I always tell you when I'm going to say something that I think is me. But I believe this is everything. You know, God will not supersede man's will. If you want to go to hell, you can go to hell. That's plain, but it's the truth. And if there's somebody that we're praying for that just does not want to submit to God, it will not live for God, that is their option. But those prayers are not wasted. This is where I see them, that they're gathered, they're gathered, they're gathered, they're gathered. And God is not going to force that person because you pray. He's going to touch that person. Every time that you pray, something's going to happen. Amen. But nothing goes to waste. Not one prayer goes to waste. Not one prayer comes to nothing. The Bible even tells us that God keeps our tears in a bottle. I don't know how much more personal you can get with God. That he would gather our tears. Listen to this description of a battle. Revelation 12. And there was a war in heaven. And Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. The dragon fought and his angels and prevailed not. Big surprise. 
neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, the old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceived the whole world. And he was cast into the earth, and the angels were cast with him. And I heard a loud voice and saying in heaven, now, come sal- now is come salvation and strength for the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of their brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. And they overcame him. They overcame him by the blood of the lamb first and by the word of their testimony that they loved not their lives Unto the death. Something a little bit like this. The devil tried to kill me, but God. Satan tried to destroy me, but God. <laughs> Evil tried to overtake me, but God. <laughs> I was a sinner, but God. Amen. I had no hope, but I, I, I met a man called Jesus. <laughs> That's my testimony. I overcame by the blood of the Lamb. And by the word of my testimony, I don't know exactly what yours is, but you have one, and it's powerful. You have one, and it's powerful. We put so much credence to the trophies of sin and the stories that come with them. And this is what happened. This is who they were. And now this is who they are. And this is what money did for them. And this is what fame has done for them. And this is what fortune has done for them. And everybody loves to hear those stories. uh, But none of them match your story. None of them match the story that you can tell that I was a prisoner in sin and God broke me out. Uh, I was lost in a way that I could not have any hope. uh, But Jesus made a way where there was no way. God got me out. He lifted me up. He set me on the rock to stay. Church, you've got a testimony. You've got a testimony. For everybody that thinks that God's mercy shows weakness and inability to deal with evil, listen to this. Revelation 19, 11. And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him was called Faithful. And true. And in righteousness he did judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire. On his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no man knew but he himself. He was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name was called the Word of God. The armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses clothed in fine linen, white and clean. I just read somewhere that that describes those who overcame, who overcame by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. And out of his mouth goes a sharp sword. There it is again, with that he should smite the nations and rule them with a rod of iron. And he treads on the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. When I began to study this and just think about this, I was immediately taken back to a place when Jesus hung on a cross and somebody put a name of mockery and said, Jesus, King of the Jews, to make fun of him. But now it is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. You see... The emperor wouldn't have allowed king of kings over Jesus. <laughs> the world couldn't tolerate that. It could be a mockery of a king of this or a king of that. But when we make him the king of kings and the lord of lords, it's a whole different thing. And he's not waiting anymore to be made that. He is that. He's coming as that. He's showing the world, this is who I am. I have always been and I will always be the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Revelation 20, verse 1, I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years and cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up. Boy, wouldn't it, man. 
<laughs> I know that's not what it means, but that's what it means to me. <laughs> he shut him up. Wouldn't you, just, wouldn't you just love to just be able to shut him up? Amen. He's always talking, isn't he? Amen. This one angel came and bound him and shut him up and put a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that, he would be loosed to season. Skipping down to verse 10. And the devil that was deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. And I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it from whose face the earth and heaven fled away and there was no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God and the books were opened and another book was opened which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead that were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead that were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. We are permitted to choose our destination. We choose eternal life in heaven or we choose eternal life in hell. This is what the Bible's telling us. Once life ends on this earth, we have chosen, and whatever we have chosen will be where we stand with God that day. We have an opportunity today to be in position for heaven. I said, we have an opportunity today to get ourselves in a position for heaven. Amen. We know that we have an opportunity to be in position to go the other place. But we haven't given, God has given us the place. He has given us a way of escape. He has given us a plan so that we could be saved. Revelation 21, 1, and I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the, for the earth for the first heaven, first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God, here it is again, shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, no more sorrow, no more crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. We're living by a whole new set of rules. And he that sat on the throne said, Said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. He said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of water of life freely. He that overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. But the fearful and the unbelieving and the abominable and the murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their place in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone. This is the second death. Wow. What an interaction. I know that's a lot of reading. I've, I've pretty much read through my whole preaching time, but I could find no better way to explain to you what it's like than to get it right from the words themselves. I, I can't describe it any better than John did because John saw it. I'm telling you what John saw. The best thing I could do is give you what, God's, what God gave to John. Church, there is a place called heaven, and it is real. And I know there are people out there that make fun of this. There are people out there that mock this. People out there that say, we're just going to go to hell and party. We're going to do... No, you're not. It's not going to be that way. It's not going to be that way. Maybe some of us in here used to say that ourselves, but we found the truth and we figured it out. Wait a minute. This is real. I want to spend heaven in I want to spend eternity in heaven. I want to be with God. I want to be on the right side of God. He's my God. He paid for me. He made a way for me to escape sin. 
Why should I go to hell? Why should I give up? Why should I quit? There's a great inheritance for me. There's a great thing was laid up for me. God has reserved a place for me. God has built a house for me. The Bible said he made a mansion for me. If all that is true, and since we believe the Bible, and I'm going to assume you all think that the Word of God is true, then what could there possibly be to quit God over? What could there possibly be that would detract us from God? What could we possibly hold on to that would be more valuable here than what God has for us there? We need to put our brain back through a whole different style of thinking and say, wait just a minute. Uh, if God has asked it, how can it be too much when he's done all this for me? If God has given me this instruction, how could I not follow it uh, when God has done all of this for me? He's d- all the things we've been blessed with already. That's what it looks like compared to heaven. Minuscule, the blessings, the things that God has done, the healings, the times he's delivered, all the miracles that he's done in our lives, all the times that God has been there in strength when we couldn't understand how we could possibly overcome. It's all nothing compared to what is coming. I I guess I could preach this a couple different ways and we've talked about it and you need to understand and respect that hell is just as real as heaven is and you don't want to go there and you don't want to be there. There's not one instance in the Bible where hell is regarded as anything but wrong. Anybody that's ever experienced it in vision or anything, a parable, it's always been a place of torment. I've got enough of that now. I said, I've got enough of that now. I have to give you both sides. You take your worst day. You take everything that has happened to you bad and you pile it into one day. It's the same measurement as how it compares to hell. That much. Doesn't even matter. You're not going to get to hell and say, well, it's, you know, I could have, but God and, and, and that person. Of, no. There's going to be nobody to blame. You're not going to get to heaven and, and say, well, you know, I just... Whatever. No. We're going to get there through the grace of God. We're going to overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. The devil thought he had me, but God. We could just sum it up with that, right? I think there's a song about, I'm hearing the music playing in my head right now. <laughs> the devil, it's not my kind of style. It's too fast. I get out of breath by the second verse. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. The devil thought he had me, but God. That's my favorite part, but God, <laughs> because it sums everything up. You can look at everything that you're dealing with. You can look at everything the devil is bringing to you to say, this is why you should quit. Compare it to heaven and hell. And see what you should do. Well, I don't know. I don't know if I should continue. I don't know if I can trust God. I don't know if. Who can you trust down here? And we know we can't trust the devil. Most of us have been there, tried that. It didn't come out too good. Trust God. If his word says to repent, then repent. His word says to be baptized in Jesus' name for the remission of your sins, then that's what it means. Well, I don't understand what that, it doesn't matter. I, I'm not really not trying to be confrontational, but it doesn't matter if we understand. What matters is that it works. I don't know why, I don't know how, that water that's in that tank comes out of the same pipe as all the other water in the building. But our obedience to God when we're baptized in Jesus' name, it works. In the Spirit, it washes away all of our sins. 
That's how it works. The Bible says that we should receive the Holy Ghost, that we will receive the Holy Ghost, but we need to receive the Holy Ghost. Why did God choose to do it through the avenue that he did? I don't know. Why couldn't he make our ears flap when we got the Holy Ghost? Why couldn't he make our nose wiggle when we got the... Why does it have to be through the evidence of tongues? I don't know. Maybe my opinion is it's because we have so much trouble with that thing that if we are surrendered enough to let God use that for just a moment, that's a sign that we're surrendered to God. <laughs> Bottom line is it doesn't matter. That's how it works. That's how it worked in the Bible, and it still works that way today. And I'll tell you this much. When you get the Holy Ghost, like the Bible says, you know you got it. You don't walk out of here wondering, did I get it? You know you got it. Everything changes. Mm. I think I'm on overtime. I can think of no other life that could even possibly compare. I know this sounds crazy, but I don't, I don't care about being rich. It doesn't matter. I don't care about having things piled up here. I don't care about... I'm not saying I'm foolish. I'm not saying that because the Bible teaches us how to manage things and we should manage properly. That's biblical. But I'm not worried about what I'm stockpiling here and, and how much I got in the bank and, and what I'm going to be able to, to stash away. I, I'm thinking about what's happening for me in heaven. What's, what's going on over there? What's happening in that retirement account? What's going on? What can, what can I do to invest more into heaven? How can I affect somebody else to help them get to heaven? Amen. You know, while we're, while we're counting the cost of everything, and we'd love to do that, we, oh, we have Missionary Sunday and, and we have the, oh, Take it up an offering. Oh my goodness. I, I count the cost, count the cost, count the cost. Don't forget to count the souls. Don't forget to count the investment. Don't forget to account what's going on in heaven. Amen. Because this world just doesn't mean that much anymore, church. Uh, I'm just passing through. The Bible said we're just pilgrims uh, and strangers, and we're going to a different place, and that place is called heaven. And I'm anxious to get there. I can't wait to see Jesus. Uh, I can't wait to see the one that has put up with me, that has tolerated me, that has forgiven me. Could we all stand together? Hallelujah. Our musicians could come. Could we just lift our hands right now? If, there, if there's anything that's got you hung up, anything that's turned your head, anything that's tempting you and pulling you, amen, I want you to try in your mind to compare it to heaven. Compare it to heaven. Compare it to that feeling we're going to have when we see Jesus with those clouds. Compare it. Can you pray? Can you lift your voice right now? Lift your voice right now. Hallelujah. Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Lord Jesus, help us sort things out in our minds. Hallelujah. Somebody reach out to God right now. Somebody reach to him right now. Lord, I love you, Jesus. I praise you, Lord. I, I, I don't know where you all are. I don't know where we all stand. But can we just talk to him right now? Jesus, Jesus in your name, I worship you, Lord. I praise you, God. I praise you, Lord. I love you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Oh, come on, church, pray. Pray. Somebody lift your voice and pray. Hallelujah. There's a place called heaven. Hallelujah. There's a, it's, it's worth every struggle. It's worth every battle. It's worth everything. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The 
this altar's open. If you wish to come and to pray, we're going to sing one of the old songs for altar today. Hallelujah. Why don't you just worship God? Praise Him. Reach out to Him. Let God fill you with the Holy Ghost today. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.
thank you, Jesus, for the promise of heaven. Man, talk about a grand tour. Imagine holding, holding Jesus' hand, taking a tour of heaven, him showing you around the house that he's had built for you, showing you where your, your prayers come up to him, showing you how it all works. That's going to be an amazing day. I'm excited for that. I think I'm most excited about being there with, with you, all being together having a whole little life point section <laughs> neighborhood maybe they'll maybe they'll set us up a neighborhood all together <laughs> yeah, that'll be great i'm excited amen i have a few announcements um the first one is uh go ahead dan if you could help me out the district family picnic Neat. This is a little bit odd. It happens every once in a while, but instead of everybody being able to individually RSVP for the event, they've asked us to do it one person on behalf of the whole church. And that's a little overwhelming because I have to speak for all of you. And so what I've done is created this form that will just let me know if you plan to come or not, and if so, how many people. And then the cutoff that they've given us is Sunday, July 30th. And then I'm going to let them know at that point, based on that form, how many people are coming from our church. I know it's a little bit weird for you to tell me so that I can tell them. That's how they asked us to do it. So I really appreciate you cooperating with me on this and filling out that form. This is going to play on all the screens. So if you can just catch it, scan it, fill it out and be done with it. If you don't want to do it that way, I did text it out last night as well. All Nation Sunday is next week. I'm so excited. <laughs> Pastor and I were here, I think it was Wednesday, and we, we were doing a little like pre-decorating to see how it would look, and it's going to look really cool, and I'm so excited. <laughs> yep, and we have 12 countries being represented from this church. I'm really excited about that, too which means a lot of wonderful food, <laughs> which is great because next slide, church-wide prayer and fasting starts the next day. <laughs> so if you can make it to All Nations Sunday, please bring your friends, bring your family. If you'd like to adopt a missionary, please let me know as soon as you can this week that you'd be interested in doing that. And then, as I said, church-wide prayer and fasting does start July 31st to August 2nd. And we will end that like we have in the past with a 60 minutes of fire service on that Wednesday night. There is a baptism today. <laughs> Jenny came all the way from Chile to be baptized in Jesus' name. And I'm so excited that she's going to be here. This is um, our friend Jessica's cousin. So they're going to let us know when it's safe to walk back there and to celebrate with her as she is born of the water today. And I'm really excited about that. If you can stay and join us for coffee and snacks, please do so. If it's your first time at Life Point, please stay and make a friend. This is a friendly bunch of people. And if you walk out of here without making a friend, you'll have done a miracle, I think. <laughs> if you stay for the coffee and leave with no friends, that's something. Uh, you might have to mark that down. <laughs> Hopefully, what you're hearing is me saying it's impossible. You're going to make a new friend if you stay and enjoy that. So I hope you do. And finally, if you'd like to give today, there's an usher by the map wall and online giving available via the QR code on the desk if we could stand together. Thank you, Jesus, for the promise of heaven. Thank you, God, for the encouragement to stay true to you because you're going to get us through and to that great reward on the other side. Touch us, Lord, as we walk through this week and help us to filter everything by heaven and remember the purpose of it all. In Jesus' name, you are dismissed.